Bruce. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's just wait a little bit and so uh, start getting some people in. Uh, can we start? Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I would like to in welcome you today to today's online discussion on capital market dimensions of forced labor trafficking. Thanks to all of you for your time and for joining us. My name is Iveta Vancakova and it's a privilege for me to moderate this discussion. Uh, just for your info, uh, after the speech of all our panelists, we will have Q&A session. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to, uh, to ask your questions and our panelists will be happy to answer. Uh, just a short note, uh, our guest Samuel Kogolati has to leave shortly after his intervention to plenary session in Belgian uh, Parliament. So uh, we are very sorry, but he would not be able to answer your questions. Now let me inter introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, I would like first to introduce Roger Robinson, who is a chairman and co-founder of the Prague Security Studies Institute. Uh, hello, Roger. Uh, now we have our beautiful ladies, Louisa Grieve, who is a director of global advocacy for the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Ha hello, Louisa. Then we have other beautiful lady, Robbie Saunders, who is a vice president of national security for the Coalition for Prosperous America. Hi, Robbie. And uh, we also have a member of uh, Chamber of Representatives of Belgium, Samuel Kogalati. Hello, Samuel. Hello. Last but not least, my colleague, uh, Elias Skolp, who is a project assistant at the Prague Security Studies Institute. Hi, Hi. Elias. And me who is Iveta Vancakova, I'm a director of Forum for Human Rights and also World Uyghur Congress policy coordinator for Visegrad countries and project coordinator at the Prague Security Studies Institute. So I will first leave uh, the word to you, Roger, because I think you are the, the, the best to, to speak at the first. Well, thank you, Iveta. And thanks to all of those joining today and taking the time to be with us. Uh, the Prague Security Studies Institute has been working uh, on uh, the human rights uh, elements of authoritarian police states, uh, notably China and Russia, uh, since its inception over 20 years ago. Uh, so there's nothing new about that. We have also tried to pioneer uh, a con the connective tissue or nexus, if you will, between human rights abuses and the funding of those companies that have been implicated in national security and human rights abuses uh, who are publicly traded and who are in the portfolios, if you can believe it, of scores of millions of European and American retail investors. Uh, they're part of the major indexes or indices uh, like MSCI, FTSE Russell, Dow S&P. Uh, they're in the investment products of BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, State Street, and other of the most notable asset managers, both in the United States and Europe. And we have found this to be a largely unrecognized dimension of the human rights abuses that we're seeing, particularly in China, which, as you know, is the leading uh, forced labor offender uh, of any nation on Earth. So that said, um, we think that this particular gathering is designed to highlight two major points that we find uh, 
as shortcomings in the current European legislative effort on forced labor, the ban that is uh, initiated by the EC and is now being adjudicated uh, in European capitals and the EU. And, uh, the, the, and it, the US has a similar problem, even though we have already passed legislation called the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, they have something in common that's a bit troubling, which is that they concentrate on products and banning the products uh, that are made with forced labor or somehow uh, forced labor is implicated. Uh, products don't make themselves. Uh, these products are manufactured or are harvested or whatever by companies. And uh, we think that it's terribly important that these companies be identified publicly. Uh, and those that are publicly traded uh, and are in the portfolios of Europeans and Americans uh, should be denied such access. Not only are they able to raise billions of dollars in investor funds, but they enjoy the privileges and frankly, the force multiplier of being accepted on the world's most prestigious uh, exchanges, namely the stock and bond markets of Europe and the United States. And this represents a kind of endorsement uh, unwittingly of the fact that they are legitimate players. Uh, and it's just fine to be uh, engaged in funding uh, entities that are in fact, we have evidence that they're, they're trafficking in forced labor. Uh, they are part of the surveillance state. Uh, they're aiding and abetting genocide. They're equipping uh, concentration camps. Uh, they are building frontline weapon systems for the PLA on the national security side. There's a host of very troubling evidence. And we worked hard along with the Coalition for a Prosperous America and others to identify these companies, demonstrate what indices they're in, what investment products they're in, and, and the inconsistency, which is frankly, in my view, unconscionable of identifying a forced labor perpetrator and at the same time having them enjoy unfettered, unimpeded access uh, to the investor financing, if you will, of again, tens of millions, scores of millions of unwitting uh, European and American investors. So uh, with that a short uh, introduction, I'd like to turn it back to Iveta and uh, onward with the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger, for your introduction. And I, I will uh, leave up to Samuel. Samuel, please. Thank you so much, uh, Iveta. And uh, thank you so much, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, for inviting me today in this very important session. Uh, I really like uh, the focus you decided to take on this very pressing issue. Um, I must tell you in all honesty that uh, the last few days have been very busy for me, uh, again, due to, to China. Uh, just a few days ago, I was alerted by the Center for Cybersecurity of Belgium, uh, my, my country, that I had been the target of a cyber attack by APT31. Uh, APT31, if you don't know, is, uh, is a group of hackers uh, linked to uh, the Ministry of State Security uh, in uh, Beijing, working directly for uh, the Communist uh, Party uh, of, of China. Um, and why is that? Why is that? Of course, because uh, I have been working for quite a long time now um, for Uyghur rights and for the recognition of both the Uyghur genocide and crimes against humanity uh, happening now in, uh, in Xinjiang. And that is, of course, um, an aspect of the fight against Uyghur first labor. And so that's why, if you allow me, I'd like to take a, a few steps back and uh, uh, start with the beginning. Uh, when I was elected uh, first in, uh, in this house, in, uh, in, in the parliament of Belgium, that was in 2019, um, I must tell you in all honesty that I didn't know much about uh, what was happening uh, to Uyghur people in, uh, in Xinjiang, China. 
But uh, just the day after my election in the parliament, I was contacted by a father, a Uyghur refugee here in Belgium. And his family is uh, four children and wife had just been arrested within the Belgian embassy in Beijing by the Chinese police. They were actually trying to come to Belgium uh, to get access at the Belgian embassy to uh, you know, join uh, the father who was already here in Belgium in Ghent as a, as a refugee. And why do I talk about this story? Because by meeting this, uh, this Uyghur dad, um, I met a lot of other Uyghur, Uyghur victims of what is ongoing there. And uh, I heard all those stories about uh, sisters, friends, uh, fathers, cousins in the camps, uh, about all those women uh, victims of uh, forced sterilization, but also about all those people uh, victims of forced labor. And very often I'm, I'm struck to notice that for people in the street, at least in my country, uh, China and Xinjiang um, seems very far away. And uh, people may tend to, you know, not feel too concerned about what is happening there and uh, tend to think that they don't really have impacts on what is happening on the ground. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And that's why I really like the focus you decided to take in, uh, in this session today. Uh, because I think we do bear a responsibility to fight against imports of forced labor products. That is indeed a very effective way to address the Uyghur human rights crisis in, in China. And I said, we do have a responsibility. I don't know if you know, but Alibaba, Alibaba is a huge firm of e-commerce, decided to choose for Belgium and Liège Airport more specifically, that's in my constituency actually, uh, as, is, as its hub between Asia, Europe, and Africa. And so actually, Belgium now serves as a hub for e-commerce, for Alibaba, and that includes, I'm sorry to say, but that's the truth, uh, Uyghur first labor products. Um, just a few months ago, we were able to identify at least two flights two direct flights operating by a company that was sanctioned by the European Union between Kashgar in Xinjiang and Liège Airport. Those two flights were full of, you know, uh, the kinds of products that can be uh, traced back uh, to uh, lines of forced labor. So I, I really just wanted to, to take the time with you to really identify the problem and uh, say why it is so concerning also for us as Belgian people here in the heart of the European Union. Now, let me speak about two solutions at the very least. There are more solutions, of course, and I hope you will identify today very many other political ways to address the same problem. But you all know that the European Commission has finally proposed an EU ban on products made by forced labor. Its president, Ursula von der Leyen, said that we need to add human dignity and freedom and that, you know, those values, those core values for the EU are more important than, that, than money. And I think that's very good and, and well, of course. Now, the, the question for me, and as you know, I'm speaking from a national parliament, not from the EU parliament, but from the national parliament at the domestic level in Belgium. The question is to know how we can actually transform that beautiful dream into legal reality. And I would say uh, by at least two ways. In, in my own parliament, um, I have submitted a bill just a few months ago in order to recognize a new crime of, import, of importing products issued from first labor. Of course, first labor as such in Belgium, on Belgian territory, is forbidden and is already criminalized. Actually, forced labor is even one of the numerous aspects of crimes against humanity. The problem is you can perfectly criminalize forced labor 
in the Belgian territory. But if you knowingly import products from first labor, let's say from Xinjiang, or we could also face other situations, like for example, uh, cobalt uh, extracted in the eastern part of the DRC, also under situation and circumstances of first labor. If you do that uh, from those third countries, uh, and if you take a direct economic advantage from importing those first labor products, actually you don't face any problem, at least uh, in terms of legal and criminal prosecution, which I think is a problem. Uh, I think it's a problem and uh, and we need to redress that. And again, that's uh, how we can act, I think, positively uh, as, uh, as drivers of political, but also legal change in the practice uh, by sitting here in this parliament. Uh, we need to say uh, very loudly, but we also need to write into the law that if you take a direct advantage from importing knowingly products from first labor in China, well, it needs to be punished. It needs to be punished. It needs to be prosecuted by the public ministry. That's completely unfair, and that needs to change. A second way which I would like to address with you, um, it, it's probably a bit more difficult, a bit more technical, uh, but it's actually um, quite uh, easy to do uh, in, in the practice, even though it takes time. You know that, um, as Roger said, uh, it is quite easy today to identify first labor perpetrators in China. At least there have been many reports by NGOs, by civil society that have been identifying uh, uh, big firms responsible for uh, uh, forced labor in, in Xinjiang. Well, what you can do is going through the reports of investments by European banks, Belgian banks, uh, or Czech banks, and look for specific investments in forced labor perpetrators. And I think those investments should be denounced. There is what we call due diligence. Those obligations of due diligence should also apply, at least in principle, to uh, financial institutions, which of course includes banks and, and insurances uh, in, in our countries. And if we want to take those due diligence obligations seriously, well, that should also apply to banks, and that should also apply to first labor perpetrators, which should be excluded from direct investments by or banks in Belgium and other European countries. So here again, those were just two uh, very simple uh, technical legal tools that we can apply in, in, in practice. In a, and again, in order to uh, terminate and, and, and to fight against uh, forced labor. Um, but again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, working with you in, uh, in the future uh, to, to continue this fight for human rights and, and worker rights uh, to, together. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel, also for your hard work. And I'm so sorry to he hear about your cyber problem. And I really wish this attacking from uh, the side of Chinese Communist Party will one day uh, finish. And now I will uh, leave the floor to you, Louisa. Thank you so much, Iveta. Um, just checking that my visuals are here and visible to everyone in the webinar. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm very, very, very grateful to um, MP Kovalati for his outstanding leadership. Um, I represent a Uyghur-led organization, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, which is a documentation and advocacy organization. Uh, and we've been documenting through at least 95 reports since 2004, so going on 20 years reporting atrocities in the Uyghur region. What's different about this ongoing genocide? And why is it, why have we been so slow to get to this point where what Roger and Samuel have been talking about is on the agenda? There are sanctions in place. I will say that, you know, the EU uh, and the UK and Canada did do joint bankruptcy sanctions on, let's count them, five perpetrators. Import bans are in place in the US, but not in Europe. We haven't talked about export bans and where we're trying to get to is investment bans. 
So this is the beginning of the story. Why are we so slow? You know, literally in a six year of a genocide, why are we still having to talk about this? Well, this was a hidden genocide at the beginning. We had people disappearing. These are famous intellectuals, relatives of people who, of uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs abroad, um, saying, where did they go? What happened? And we had great media work covering what was going on in, their, in the Uyghur homeland in East Turkestan, Xinjiang's autonomous Uyghur region. So you could see on the streets when journalists were allowed there that there were police stations, there were checks uh, on the streets. You had uh, the Wall Street Journal did an amazing job uncovering the surveillance state. These are paper forms finding with details about uh, all the Uyghurs who were expressing their identity seen as a threat by the state. The state sent cadres inside people's homes. Uh, they gave it a very nice name called Becoming Family. The idea was basically come in and spy on people. Uh, and then camps started opening up. And this is just a screenshot from a police social media. This was not hidden. Um, there, they did, police did post photos of uh, lining people up, random people. They look like prisoners, but actually they're all innocent people who've been accused of thought crime. And then we started to use the term concentration camp. This is emerging slowly, however. Now, why do I say the words concentration camp? Uh, because you can have a giant building here that literally says concentrated transformation through education training center. Of course, this is all denied by the government, uh, but satellite photos showed that when you have a giant building here, and then you can match a street level view taken by a journalist with satellite photography, you can see that giant building on the left is only a small part of a huge complex. And they were all over the country with the hallmarks of prisons. Uh, even if they said training center on the outside, it's actually a prison uh, here from bitter winter. And the size was amazing. Uh, here you have Wall Street Journal again, looking at comparing from one year to the next, the incredible expansion. So I believe the world was still trying to take in what is really happening. Is it at really at this incredible scale? But then we started to see where is the connection to forced labor? And it's fairly early on. I'm talking 2018. You can see the government. This is a government uh, Global Times poster. Clearly, there is labor going on. And you're starting to see Remember, December 2018, right? Five years ago, uh, four, four and some years ago, already the connection to international commerce, sports were traced to one of the factories in one of the concentration camps that are part of the genocide. But here we look, the Washington Post does an editorial a year later, 2019, saying evidence is emerging. You can imagine the frustration of Uyghurs saying, why does it take one year to discover this. And we were grateful to the Australian Policy Institute for their groundbreaking story, Uyghurs for Sale. The Washington Post did some on the ground research to complement Aspie's uh, desk research and digging into company records, as Samuel said. Um, Anna Fifield hung out for four days outside a Nike factory in Northern China, finding Uyghurs having transported 3000 kilometers across the country. And so you get the pressure, what is the international uh, fashion industry doing about this? Do we, we know about it? Are they just continuing business as usual? A coalition was formed, the coalition to end forced, way, uh, forced labor in the Uyghur region, uh, which called on brands voluntarily to take action to completely end all business ties. And this was now enact, enacted into law in the US to have not only building on a ex pre-existing US ban on imports of forced and prison labor goods and child labor goods, uh, this, of course, as you all know, came into effect starting in June 2022, and we have one photograph that the Customs and Border Protection has released showing them at the ports stopping products from the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, uh, which is a, a forced labor uh, paramilitary uh, institution that runs prisons. Now, that's the forced labor goods, and like Samuel, I want to then turn to the surveillance question and their connections to international commerce. Um, we're not we're looking at incredible surveillance. Uh, of course, there's surveillance all over China, um, but it was driven by the ability to uh, collect data by force in China, where every Uyghur was taken in, in for mandatory health checks, uh, for DNA testing, and in the police stations, face scans and voice scans. Um, you can see it, the technology put to work with QR codes, 
um, on the door so that a policeman can come by with a little handheld device, high tech, uh, you know, innovation to track who belongs in this house and is anybody staying there unauthorized. And we're talking about here the New York Times showing uh, facial, racial profiling um, using face scans and translated for us um, a, a marketing tool from one of these companies, Cloudwalk, um, showing how they can uh, prevent sensitive peoples, meaning Tibetans and Uyghurs, from coming anywhere. Um, this was again reported in February 2019. Here's a, a PowerPoint that was recently released as part of the Xinjiang police files, which is massive trove of internal government documents, um, where this is just a neighborhood policing station showing their superiors how they were using closed circuit TV to track and control things. And let's talk name names and talk brands. Here we have uh, Huawei um, already coming out and look at this number, a billion dollar profit. So profitable companies that are, as Roger said, listed on it through exchanges so that international investors can try to put their hard earned money to work and the banks and the pension funds and the university endowments can earn a profit by investing in profitable companies. Where do they get their profits? They get billion dollars uh, worth of profits from the genocidal government to do their work. Here's Dakwa with its so-called safe city programs, a uh, euphemism for building out the surveillance state. And here's a list of 11 companies uh, which are now under investment ban sanctions from the US, uh, it's far too little. We know it's a much larger number. So, and I just wanna bring it home here in, in Europe. Um, you know, UHRP has done reporting about the surveillance that goes outside the country to uh, surveil Uyghurs, uh, to suppress free speech, to prevent them from, un from speaking out against the genocide. Um, and we even have Alibaba, Sam, Samuel Kogalati mentioned Alibaba. Well, we did a report already two years ago uh, about Alibaba's, one of Alibaba's subsidiaries, the Taobao auction site, auctioned the property of a slew of very successful Uyghur entrepreneurs who were put in prison, put on trial for extremist thought or being uh, in some way a, a criminal offense. Their property seized and sold. Wall Street Journal did an exclusive on this and found at least $84 million in some court records online that hadn't been properly hidden by the Chinese authorities to show um, the, the uh, complicity of Alibaba, which is New York Stock Exchange listed. So again, where are we gonna get with our sanctions to respond to the genocide? Thank you so much. Thank you, Louisa. And I will just short give a short remark from my side as uh, from somebody who is a uh, human rights, let's say, fighter. Uh, and I will maybe also uh, follow what uh, what Samuel said, that we feel like uh, China is very far away and, and this is not something that, that we have to follow. But the truth is that, that uh, I mean, from my perspective as somebody who was born in Czechoslovakia, is, uh, I feel like it's necessary to say that we, a lot of uh, European countries remember a communist regime. And um, uh, forced labor was one of the tools uh, used by communist regime to bind our freedoms and uh, led to human rights violations. And now this is happening in China. And I think, uh, I still feel that, like forced labor is more moral uh, unacceptable. No child, woman or man should suffer this serious human rights abuse. And uh, I think it's time for Europe and not just for U US uh, to take action in order to protect investors, corporations, and uh, customers over the exploitation of uh, forced labor, uh, especially for us Europeans who whose past is quite similar. I expect faster reactions, faster actions, and more strict position. Uh, and I believe we need to take a few steps now and immediately. Uh, because every second passes cause life damage and traumas. And although I'm glad to see the European Commission initiative effective, effectively uh, banning products produced, extracted or harvested with forced labor. So now I leave the floor to my colleague Elias, 
who has uh, researched this in last month. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So my name is Elias Kuld. Uh, I'm a um, uh, research associate here at PSSI. Uh, I served as a lead researcher for uh, this uh, forced labor initiative. Um, so I really don't need to explain to you guys that the EU is committed to combating forced labor and um, that it, it, it's very vocal about its um, uh, work with, with human rights. Um, an example of this, for example, is in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in Article 5, Paragraph 2, where it specifically outlines uh, combating forced labor as a, as a high priority. So this proposal can be sort of considered a reflection or a, um, yeah, a reflection of this commitment to, uh, to these principles of combating forced labor. Uh, to just really briefly summarize the, the goal or the intention of the proposal, um, it focuses on having uh, the competent national authorities of EU member states, so think the police or customs authorities, um, investigating whenever they find that a product uh, or suspect that a product is made or tainted with forced labor. What this means is that the burden of proof lies on the national competent authorities um, rather than the importers, as is the case with the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, in, in the US, which is a differentiation we can get into a bit more later. Um, just quickly, regarding the legislative process, there is really no way of knowing how long time this will take. Uh, right now, the European Commission has sent this proposal to the European Parliament and to the Council, where the co-legislators are uh, debating this and discussing this um, as part of the ordinary legislative procedure. Uh, again, there's no timeline for this, uh, so there's people, parliamentarians are hoping that this will be done within 2023, but that's nothing more than, than a hope. So this can be anything from a matter of mere months to getting caught up in some legislative limbo for uh, who knows how long. Um, in response to this, uh, to this proposal, PSSI has offered direct uh, feedback, which we uploaded directly to the uh, European Commission. That's also available on our website if anyone's interested. And I'll distill this down to our two core points. Uh, the first one being that we believe that the proposal has to expand in its scope to cover not only these products, but also the companies behind these products. Because like Roger said, these products don't manufacture themselves. Uh, and secondly, uh, we of course believe that capital markets needs to be addressed in this. Uh, capital markets play an incredibly crucial role in uh, acting as a facilitator for, for uh, funding these um, companies and actors that exploit forced labor. So uh, capital markets is completely unaddressed in the proposal and that has to change. Um, on a more uh, sort of personal note, um, I, I want to highlight uh, that this initiative sort of serves as, has, has a potential to serve as the first steps in linking human rights and capital markets. I think that these two things are intrinsically linked. Um, just the idea of at home and products that we use perhaps every day being created with forced labor, it uh, not only impacts our global reputation, um, but also it has direct impacts on our economies. The use of forced labor uh, undermines and violates our values of uh, freedom and the rule of law just as much as it undermines the basic economic principles of fair competition. Um, and as forced labor robs people of their dignity, uh, it also condemns economic communities to cycles of poverty, to uh, inequality and to abuse. Uh, and so just as, as one final sort of uh, note to, to, to leave this on, uh, I just want to say that one way or another, every investment that we make is an investment into our future. Uh, and with that uh, in mind, I will leave you over to uh, Robbie, who um, knows this uh, very well. Great. Thanks so much, Elias. And thanks, everyone, for all the wonderful remarks. I'm conscious of the fact that I am the last one to go, so I will try to keep it uh, brief and short so we can move to the discussion and to the question and answer portion. I'm going to start off by briefly talking about how the U.S. is implementing our Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act and a few observations that we've made from my organization um, with how that's going. And then I'll dovetail into what Elias was speaking of and what Roger opened with, um, talking about the investment ban. Um, so first of all, in regards to uh, how our UFLPA implementation is going, um, we have had some great success, as Louisa was showing, you know, the, the photo of the XPCC goods, um, you know, being actively uh, seized, inspected, and monitored by the CBP. 
Um, and the U.S. Congress has given an increase in appropriations to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection um, for the implementation of this law, which is really important for us to see it be uh, fully effective. Um, and recently, I've spoken with um, the head of, uh, of China uh, for the U.S. CBP, and he uh, definitely sees, sees progress and sees some good uh, work being done when it comes to interdiction. Um, but maybe this is um, uh, too, too American of me to say, but there's still a lot more work to do. And we see a few, a few areas uh, of needed improvement. Um, and we're working closely with uh, the, the human rights community and with Congress and with our friends at CBP, as well as at ILAB, which is the U.S. Department of Labor's um, Bureau of International Labor Affairs um, and our friends over there um, to increase, you know, the work being done here under the auspices of the UFLPA. So a few of those areas that I just want to flag for, for, for hopeful improvement and that we're, we're thinking about and tracking is this concept in the U.S. regarding what is considered to be formal entry versus informal entry of goods. So there's a formal entry threshold in America of $2,500. And so what we're seeing with the UFLPA is that incoming um, you know, shipments and imports coming in above $2,500 are getting due diligence, but under $2,500 are maybe not. Um, and that's something that we think is, is maybe a bandwidth issue, is a staffing issue, a capacity issue, um, but we're seeking to solve that. Furthermore, um, our de minimis threshold is $800. And so goods can enter the U.S. without any inspection and, and duty-free if the shipment is $800 or lower. And I know for, for the uh, European Union, I believe that threshold is 150 euros. So our, our threshold is about 754 euros um, if you converted that in America. And so we're seeing a lot of potential forced labor goods slipping in under that category um, you know, things like uh, Alibaba type products or, or women's fashion from Shein, you know, things that are coming in that are cheaply made oftentimes in in small batch, um, you know, shipments that are not being tracked. Um, and then lastly, I'll say too, you know, we would love to see a more transparency in terms of importers um, having to provide their bills of lading. And so Louisa knows um, our long held, uh, you know, concerns about how this works, but within the U.S. government, um, if you come in, uh, your goods are coming in on an airplane, you do not have to provide the same type of records and make publicly available your import information than if you did if your goods were coming in on a cargo ship, for example. And then even more so, um, you could request that your records not be made public and the government can then seal your information so that NGOs and civil society or competitor companies cannot police you. And that's something that, uh, to, to, to Samuel's point earlier too, you know, regarding um, this new e-commerce hub for Alibaba in Belgium and the flights that they had observed, you know, coming in, you know, that, that that's hard to do um, in the U.S. just because of, again, the, the lack of transparency on bills of lading. Um, and then, of course, we'd love to see, you know, more lab testing. We find that these shipments that come in under the formal threshold or that are under the de minimis threshold or come in by, you know, air cargo as opposed to a ship or other freight form, um, you know, their lab testing is not widely available. And we'd love to see more of that. Um, beyond just how UFLPA is going, um, shifting over to divestment, um, we are so excited about the future work that we can do in this space and to build off of exactly what everyone is, has been thinking about. You know, it's stopping the goods is important and forced labor goods and it have been illegal in the United States since the 1930s. So this is something we've been tracking for a long time and we're so grateful that the UFLPA created this new mechanism with the rebuttable presumption, which I know Elias was really clear to distinguish is different than the, the, the proposal right now in the, in the uh, EU. But I think that what's really key here is that we're looking at how we can take that rebuttable presumption um, and then expand further to the actual folks behind those goods and how we can look at divestment. And so for us, um, we think that the UFLPA entity list is nice, but what it does is it names companies that are outside of Xinjiang because everything in Xinjiang is presumed to have been made with forced labor. So anything that's Xinjiang produced or labor transfer produced um, has this rebuttable presumption applied to it. But there's this additional list that, that they created and that the US government is tracking of companies that they believe also should rise to the same threshold of presuming forced labor. But that list is really small. And so we want to, by tracking these companies, by 
labeling their, their financers, by labeling the ways that the U.S. is funding them and Western investors are funding them, be able to bring more offenders into the light. And I know I'm running out of time, Iveta, so um, feel free to inter intervene here and, and stop me. But that is our, our main objective, is how can we get these guys labeled, get them out there, and, and, and denote where you can make choices and changes in your own investment behavior so that you're not funding Alibaba or Hikvision or Tencent or these other guys. Um, and I will say that uh, Coalition for a Prosperous America very soon uh, will be working um, to release a product that outlines about 66 or so of these companies. And so we can know exactly where some of these guys are, who is, is investing in them and how you can change your own behavior such that your um, exchange traded funds, your mutual funds, you know, where you're putting your money is not supporting these forced labor um, and surveillance you know, state offenders. So with that, back over to you, Ivetta. Thank you very much, Robbie, and thank you also for telling us about the 66 uh, companies. I think this is very, uh, could be also very interesting for us to know and also very, very important job. Uh, now we, I'm opening the Q&A session and we have uh, some questions here. So let me read the first questions. Uh, bank, banks often uh, take a pretty approach to compliance with regulation. That is, they are actively comparing uh, the expected returns to expected consequences. Further, several countries, UK or Australia, have introduced legislation nominally against forced labor in supply chains. But there is little evidence that those are moving companies to action. What specific consequences do you suggest to investing in firms known to use forced labor that would be an effective deterrent? So please, if any, yes, Roger, please. Okay, so I, there are a number of ways that this could be accomplished, but just let me give you a thought or two on that. Uh, in the US, uh, with Executive Order 13959 under President Trump and Executive Order 14032 under President Biden, these executive orders provided, in effect, that companies, uh, Chinese publicly traded companies that were doing business with uh, military uh, Chinese companies, that is, supporting the military industrial complex of China, uh, would be barred, uh, that is, US citizens would be barred from holding the securities, read the stocks and bonds, uh, of those companies, it would become illegal uh, to do so. Uh, in the Biden administration, it, it would become uh, incumbent on folks that were holding such companies to not be able to buy and sell those stocks, for example, thereby making them non-viable. So I would say that um, that, that is a model, a precedent uh, for what we could see on forced labor abusers uh, with respect to their presence on European and U.S. exchanges. Uh, the most effective way possible would be uh, to basically uh, uh, den deny uh, or make illegal the holding of those securities uh, in forced labor perpetrating companies. Uh, that would be the far, far, by far the most effective. You could also delist or deregister such companies, deregistering being a stronger measure than delisting uh, from such exchanges. Uh, that would certainly get China's attention. We have to recognize that these are capital market sanctions that China genuinely fears. This is not uh, the, the slap on the wrist that we're used to seeing, uh, whereby they uh, you're not modifying corporate behavior, really, even in the US and Europe, because the penalties are not compelling enough. And capital markets, when you're talking about the money, uh, all of a sudden that equation changes very radically. So uh, that's why we feel so strongly that capital market sanctions are arguably the most powerful source of leverage, the most powerful persuasive tool that we have in our non-military arsenal to attack and, and defend uh, human rights abuse against human rights abuses of this kind. 
So that's why we feel so strongly uh, that these this new set of tools uh, are made available uh, to both sides of the Atlantic and are used effectively to put real fear on the part of those in China, as well as the US uh, Wall Street uh, players and their equivalents in Europe who are seeing large fees, who feel that they want to continue uh, to make those fees. And uh, if it gets in the, uh, human rights is a distant uh, second concern. It's almost like it's somebody else's job. There's no due diligence taking place per se on national security and human rights concerns today. No, you don't see, it's very rare that you see fund managers, asset managers, index providers that are voluntarily divesting these stocks, even though their corporate reputations and brands could be put at risk. And we very much want those corporate reputations and brands put at risk. And you, you start to play in that league, and I'll tell you, it will turn around what the questioner uh, is legitimately concerned about, which is nobody seems to be reacting. Well, we think that this gathering that we're having right now is the beginning of changing that risk calculus fundamentally. Thank you. And Yvette, if we have a moment, I'd like to just add on briefly to what Roger shared. Yeah, please. In, in um, in addition to what Rogers mentioned about the executive actions taken by the U.S. government, uh, the Congress is actually looking to pass a law to further codify and strengthen these capital markets bans and expand them. And so there's been a couple of hearings held in, in Congress. And I think there's a realization that a lot of the supply chain due diligence isn't quite working or there's a lot of, you know, box check activity happening of companies submitting you know, PDF forms to say that they're complying, but then there's a, a lack of true follow through. And so to Roger's point, you know, we believe firmly the capital market sanctions component, the forced, um, you know, divestment um, or prohibitions on trading is, is the key. And the U.S. government's looking to go beyond some of this, the surveillance technology companies or the military companies, but to other human rights abusers as well. I really think it's an excellent question. I want to bring up another tool, which is an excise tax on institutions that hold these complicit uh, companies in their portfolios. So for example, you take a university endowment, public or private, many of them have endowments, which they invest in the markets, and they have special tax privileges, um, right? They're not paying, they're nonprofit institutions, they're not paying taxes on their earnings like anyone else. And so one option is to say, well, there will be a tax. And in fact, there are some members of the US Congress that wanna tax the an excise tax on the entire amount of the profit that they would get from funding the activities and expanding the you know, market power of those companies that are selling their, good, their surveillance systems to the Xinjiang government, for example, in order to carry out a genocide. So an excise tax uh, is actually a, a tax rather than a ban, which should provide real leverage to make these fund managers think twice. Thank you, all of you. I just want to add that if anyone else have any other questions, please feel free to write. And I would like to ask you, Henley, just a, a bit shorter question uh, answer, so we can we can I think go on uh, more questions. So now I have a question on Luisa. Thinking beyond just Europe and the US, if we were to move forward with capital uh, markets and investment ban on uh, forced labor abusers, what would that mean for the Uyghur population in China who have been victims of the CCP tolerance of and even encouragement of forced labor practices? Uh, thank you for that question, Iveta. And again, I, I haven't said thank you to you for all you're doing um, over these last several years to really um, try to uh, wake up Europeans um, along with people around the world to say there is something we can do, as Roger and, and Samuel both said. Um, I think for, for Uyghurs, uh, since I work for a Uyghur-led organization, I can say that uh, inaction is a green light for genocide. 
And again, I emphasized this sort of 2018, 2019, you know, when the information is known, a lot of people feel European values, you know, America's support for, for human rights um, and defending democracy around the world should mean action. And when you see pinprick actions around the world, Uyghurs are really wondering, is the world happy with an ongoing genocide? Um, just business as usual, our profits are more important. Wall Street has a bigger voice than people whose own relatives are being uh, tortured. So this um, frustration for Uyghurs to really weeping for their family, their homeland, you know, being in exile, um, it really actually makes them wonder where the commitment is. So that's part of the emotional reaction, if that's what you're asking me to convey. Thank you so much, Agata. Thank you, Luisa. And now I will leave the world to uh, Elias. Yeah, uh, I think we have a uh, question here for Robbie, although I do believe that Roger, you may be able to add uh, to this as well. Uh, the question being, what direction do you see Washington DC heading in regarding forced labor legislation in the near future? And is this considered a bipartisan issue in the US? Or will the direction Washington takes be heavily influenced by whether a Democrat or Republican controls uh, the executive office or, or the House or the Senate? I'll jump in and start off the answer and then turn it over to Roger to, to fill in what I, what I missed. Um, so this is a really bipartisan issue for us. Um, we have seen great success, you know, with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act being led by uh, Representative McGovern, by Senator Rubio. You know, we've had such engagement from, you know, uh, the leaders of several different U.S. entities that are uh, congressional executive, you know, commission on China um, with the new China Select Committee that was created in the U.S. House of Representatives um, and the, these bodies that are bipartisan um, and they continue to do this great work. So uh, Representative Mike Gallagher and then Representative Christian Morthy, um, a Republican and a Democrat, are co-leading this new China Select Committee um, in Washington that held their first hearing um, this week on Tuesday evening. And actually in their hearing, they talked about divestment and went through the US sanctions apparatus and our gaps in our sanctions policy. And when I talk about sanctions, I'm talking about you know, capital market sanctions, about our export controls um, and about how we can, we can do more there. Um, and so there's a lot of really great bipartisan interest. And actually Roger got a shout out in that hearing on Tuesday night, which was, was great. Um, so I do see that there's going to be some future work, um, both with this legislation moving um, in terms of sort of codification of capital market sanctions, um, as well as expanding our, our standards on, on human rights violations and how we can more closely, um, you know, link the capital markets piece to the human rights element. Um, and, and I do think, too, that regardless of a Republican or Democrat, you know, being um, in, in charge of either Chamber of Commerce or Congress or the White House, that there is interest and there will be committed action. I think it just takes a little bit different angle and a little bit different flavor, um, but there's a lot of bills moving bipartisanly. Um, and there's actually interesting confluence of partisan needs um, on both sides of, of, of what angles, what arguments, you know, and what are their, what do they care about more that pulls on, you know, their policy heartstrings to take, take action. Um, but I think there is definitely a committed bipartisan effort there. Um, and I do think you'll see something sometime this year, maybe, um, on further supporting the UFLPA from our, from, from our government, whether it's um, expanded authorities or more appropriations or something. I think that there's a lot of momentum um, behind continued successful implementation um, there. And uh, I would just add that uh, Robbie's got a much better handle on Capitol Hill's uh, mood because she's taking the pulse every single day. Uh, I would merely say that this is one of the really rare uh, instances of bipartisan foreign policy, national security policy, you know, in the history of this country, uh, in the U.S. side. Uh, it, it's, an, it's a matter of education of the type that we're trying to advance uh, with gatherings like this. For example, you can be sure that the Congress, if they understood that it's trillions of dollars, not hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars over these past uh, several years have moved from the uh, from American retail investors and their retirement and other investment accounts uh, into the coffers of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, that's not some wild claim. Uh, that's a fact, an empirical, provable fact. Uh, just like what we're saying in terms of forced labor companies, littering 
the portfolios of major asset managers like BlackRock and Vanguard. That is a fact. They are also in all the major indices, MSCI again, FTSE Russell, Dow S&P. So you can't argue with the empirical evidence. And it's amazing that the due diligence uh, and the risk that these asset managers and index providers are running by themselves trafficking in effect in these companies hasn't been uh, adequately recognized. So I think with the new mood in the Congress and frankly, uh, some of the activities of the Republican now controlled House, such as the China Select Committee, there's going to be a much deeper dive. And when that happens, uh, these are the kinds of revelations that they're going to see. There are 35, 35 or so Chinese companies in the federal thrift retirement system. That's the pension system of the American government. All of our military are holding uh, Chinese CCP companies that are implicated in weapons manufacturing uh, designed to, of course, to be used against them in a future conflict. So in other words, uh, the abuses are uh, multifaceted, forced labor being one very troubling category, but there are others and in the human rights area as well. So uh, the point is that I think that you're going to see uh, the aperture expand uh, considerably now. And when that happens, there's a, a recognition that Wall Street and other Wall Street equivalents in Europe have frankly a, quite a cynical attitude toward all this. They're so recalcitrant, it's so greed driven, frankly, that you're going to have to make it illegal because they have already stated that if it's legal, they don't give a damn they're going to proceed until it's illegal. Well, okay, if that's the way you want to be, <laughs> we'll arrange for it to become illegal. And that's why there's going to be a very concentrated effort to take advantage of this new bipartisan uh, political feeling on Capitol Hill and elsewhere and in the 50 states and in the university endowments, as Louise has pointed out, I mean, this is a widespread abuse and the states should care. And in many cases already have taken action to put their pension system administer, administrators on the hot seat to say, how in good conscience can you be having the public employees of Tennessee or West Virginia or wherever it may be, Florida, that are investing in these companies. So it's not just a federal thing, although the federal level is the best from the point of view of law passing, that's for sure. But nevertheless, that's the scale. And just a final note on that, when you talk about leverage, uh, the US capital markets, for example, are roughly the size of the rest of the world's combined. The US has 66% of the world's investable capital and liquidity. Now just think about those numbers for a minute. In other words, you can say, well, the Chinese companies will simply go elsewhere to raise their money. That's kind of a joke. Where? London, Frankfurt, Milan? I mean, there's no liquidity, uh, insufficient liquidity and depth to go elsewhere. I mean, the US has a dominant position in the global financial domain. That's just a fact. And combined with our European friends, uh, and Japanese who care about this issue deeply, I know that for a fact, we have all the makings of a global effort here to employ finally our greatest source of leverage, which is the money. I'll say again, uh, and I think the, break, the breakthrough is going to come. And one other point really quickly uh, to add to what Roger said is uh, disclosures are really important to us and something that we see possible action on as well, um, because there's such a lack of transparency right now with these, these companies and how they're playing the games in the market. And so as we're building toward you know the, the illegal action and making these things impossible to do, um, we also were increasing information uh, transparency and empowering the individual investors um, and, and those that are working with the state pension funds or the university endowments um, to say, you know, you're you're have the knowledge now. You know these companies are bad. 
we're requiring information about you know, beneficial ownership or linkages to CCP, state-owned enterprises, et cetera, to come to the forefront, which then means that it makes it basically impossible then for the investment behavior to continue. And so that's a one avenue that we see a lot of bipartisan interest in as well, is how can we increase transparency, disclosures, um, and oversight to then force the divestment and then force the, the, the money from stopping flowing. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Robbie. And Louisa, I have a question uh, to you. How successful are we in punishing Western companies making use of products originating from forced labor? Uh, thanks, Evita, and thank you to the participant who raised the question. Yes, um, <laughs> human rights groups, Uyghurs, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, are very impatient for punishment. Um, we have seen some reporting coming from our customs uh, Department, Customs and Border Protection Commission to the tune of about, um, by some counts, almost a billion dollars worth of goods at least detained for inspection. Unfortunately, we don't know that much about how many were seized uh, uh, and destroyed, uh, how many were simply turned around and the importer was able to say, ah, well, if you are going to ask me to prove that my supply chain is free of, of Uyghur forced labor, then never mind, I'm going to have to re-export. We don't know how much of that is happening. So all of our coalition, um, the Coalition to End Forced Labor in the Uyghur region, all the human rights groups are saying, we have to have that transparency of data, even know about the enforcement. Congress needs to know if they've made this uh, commitment. So that is a commitment that CBP has made to make more information available. So we don't. the answer is we don't really know, but we do know one thing. There have been no announced fines or penalties. The most that might have happened is that a company has its shipment slowed, so that interrupts their profit, right? They are operating on their margins. If your things are seized, you have to go through a back and forth to try to prove that your goods are not made with forced labor. Yes, that can be a cost to business and should be a deterrent. Uh, and yet we know there are these seizures all the way through. This, this law has been known since December last year, it's already a year, more than a year, and still things are being detained. So it does go to that question that Roger is raising, like what is going on in the minds of the companies when they somehow think that this won't affect them. But obviously it would be very salutary to have some real fines and penalties or criminal prosecutions, uh, as Samuel mentioned, for knowingly importing uh, these goods. So it's a, it's a story that has yet to be told. Great, thank you. Um, this is a bit of an open question. I want to say we have approximately, I'd say, around five more minutes of Q and A time. So perhaps a bit of a brief answer. Um, they, um, and this is just an open question. The Corporate Accountability Lab has introduced evidence that U.S. prison labor is a high risk for forced labor. Further, the ILO made reference in their 2022 prevalence report to the danger that. Given the evidence of racialized differences in sentencing, that the U.S. is in danger of state-imposed forced labor within its prison systems. So the question is as follows. What can the EU do through mechanisms like proposed import bans and proposed investment bans like this one to increase transparency and protect the rights of U.S. prisoners? You know, I personally don't have a, an observation on that only because that requires, in effect, a separate uh, background study. And I'm afraid, you know, from my point of view, at least, it's outside of the scope a little bit of uh, the proceedings today. I I'm, I'm no doubt that it's a legitimate question, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, U.S. forced labor um, fits quite properly in, in, in this context, would be my observation. But I thank the questioner anyway. Right. I think we can run with uh, one final question. Um, of the policy ideas and proposals being discussed, which ones do the panelists think are most likely to advance in this session of the U.S. Congress? Uh, Robbie, maybe? Great, sure. Uh, so we know that codifying the investment ban and the capital market sanction uh, policy, as Roger noted, with these previous executive orders of both the Trump and Biden administrations, is underway. And so we very much so hope uh, that this bill um, gets, you know, moved to the House floor and, and should actually fairly easily pass in the Senate. Um, and so what it does is strengthens the penalties 
of companies that are listed on our non-SDN Chinese military industrial complex companies list, which includes some of the surveillance tech companies as well as those military civil fusion companies. And so it would I would ratchet up those punishments as well as then expand the scope of, of who gets on it by taking another list from the US government over. So I think for, for my perspective, that bill, which has already been part of a hearing in February in the House Committee on Financial Services, uh, stands the greatest chance of, of advancing. But we have a whole slew of um, efforts, including some work in the pension fund department, divesting the federal pension system uh, from uh, Chinese companies. Um, you know, it's over $730 billion. We have, we have several irons in the fire um, overall in terms of, of loopholes and gap closing. Um, but for me, I, th I think it's that, you know, codification of our cap market sanctions regime, as well as something in, in regards to the uh, UFLPA kind of 2.0, um, which we hope comes to be. But I'll turn it over to Louisa. Uh, I would also add that it does look, uh, as Robbie mentioned, that there will be um, more sanction authorities that Congress is going to look to literally with the, taking the genocide as a focus and looking where more sanctions can come in because there are more privileges of travel, um, right? Not every perpetrator is um, named on a, a visa ban um, and corporate, corporate and uh, and perpetrator accountability are absolutely on the agenda and there is a bipartisan support for that. We haven't seen a bill yet. So there are a large choice, a large, we have a good choice um, and we do expect that with the revelations, you know, the whole purpose of this uh, health select committee um, as stated by the bipartisan leadership chair and ranking member is to enable the American voters um, to see what the, the threats are. And then we do expect that action will come more quickly perhaps than in the past. Um, and, and my my only thought uh, to the question would be that um, it's useful to think of the cap market uh, issue as having three pillars, human rights, national security, and investor protection. There's not one Chinese company of the over 5,000 traded in the United States that is compliant today with US federal securities laws. As we may know, those Chinese companies are black boxes. They don't reveal their finances. They don't, uh, they're not audited by US government uh, entity as called for uh, by the law. Uh, the point is that the investor protection, the, the, the complete, again, black box non-transparency uh, and investor protection angle is a very important one. And I think that it is a way forward uh, legislatively to basically say that China's not abiding by the rules that every other player in the market's abiding by, and that's simply not on. So it's very useful to keep in mind these three pillars uh, of, again, uh, human rights, national security, and investor protection. Uh, you know, we talk about another legislative vehicle would be sanctions harmonization. You know, you're on a sanctions list of the Commerce Department called the entity list, the blacklist. You're presumably not allowed to get a license for American equipment and technology because you're an egregious national security or human rights abuser corporately. But at the same time, you can continue to raise money and trade to your great advantage on the U.S. capital markets and even the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ uh, with impunity. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to, uh, uh, glaring inconsistency that we're trying to remedy here by saying, look, if you can't, uh, if you're out of U.S. equipment and technology, you darn well should be out of the U.S. capital markets as well. So that's another one that has a very good chance. And, and uh, we could go through a, a, a list here, but I do believe that, uh, that Robbie's right that it's going to be a very active year in uh, this category uh, because as I said, there are a troubling number of avenues whereby China is not playing by the global rules and is profiting handsomely despite the continuation of these heinous practices. And that's what we're all about going after. And I thank you again for all of your attention today. 
Thank you very much. I'm opening like last one minute of uh, if you have any uh, final thoughts or remarks. Very I'll shortly. Just, yeah, I'll just briefly say I'm very grateful for this opportunity to join all of you today and we look forward to seeing uh, the final product and, and actions coming out of uh, the, the EU and are grateful that others are, are taking steps here to try and combat these atrocities and grateful for my co-panelists today. I found Louisa's presentation to be so thorough and in, in terms of documenting, you know, why why we're here and why we care about this. And um, I would just add that we will be sharing, you know, our list of forced labor um, and surveillance state companies with all of you soon. Um, we're just putting a few polishing touches on how we're presenting it and some data visualization um, kind of graphics that we thought would be helpful um, coming up at the last minute, but we believe it's truly the next step uh, to building on the successes um, of the UFLPA thus far is to stop the financing um, of, of these goods and of these companies that are complicit in producing them. So thank you all very much. Thank For you. Do, and, sorry. And I just wanted to add that if anyone is interested in this uh, topic, we are also organizing one event in April in Prague. So stay tuned and, and just please follow our uh, website of Prague Security Studies Institute or, or also our uh, social uh, accounts of all the panelists. And yeah, Louisa, please. I, I want to give a big shout out to um, a very broad coalition of groups who uh, work on modern slavery, trafficking, uh, human rights more broadly, including the trade union sector. Um, so for a lot of people who might say, you know, it's really a, a partisan thing, whether it, or ideological, whether in Europe or the US, to be anti-China. Well, let's say that global movements like the global trade union movement, the AFL-CIO and the ITUC at the international level, that is the, it's the trade unions that are bringing state-sponsored forced labor to the ILO where China has a seat and business has a seat and labor has a seat. So there is quite a broad coalition and we're frustrated at lack of progress, but we're not frustrated at the growing number of allies who are ready to push back on Wall Street uh, and the corporate complicity. Okay, if no any any other remarks, then I will close uh, the discussion of today. I would like to thanks to our uh, great panelists uh, for this interesting and very important topic. And uh, thank you also all of you for your time and joining us. Uh, thanks also for all the organizations who were uh, organizing this event, especially Prague Security Studies Institute, Uyghur Human Rights Project, Forum for Human Rights and Coalition for Prosperous America. Thank you all of you for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much.